Good evening. I want to begin with a familiar picture. Now, most of you have seen this illustration, but let me ask you, what do you see when you look at this image? If you said an old lady with a huge nose, you're correct. And if you see the profile of a classy young lady, you're also correct. If you're having a hard time, the part which is the old woman's nose is the young woman's jaw. Her head is turned away from you. The old woman's left eye is her ear and the old woman's mouth is the young woman's necklace. The tiny lump that looks like an old woman's wart on her nose is the nose of the young woman. While you definitely can't see any of the images without your eyes, nothing would make sense without input from our brain. In this slide, perhaps you see a woman. But then again, perhaps you see the trumpeteer. Besides being entertained, there is an explanation for what you see or don't see. For time's sake, I'll give you a short version of a complex process. It all has to do with how the lens of the eyeball focuses light back onto the retina. Information about the light entering the eye travels through the optic nerve, where it is ultimately interpreted by the brain. The brain uses our memory in order to make sense of the images that it sees. Now that requires too much brain power to process all of it. In order to simplify the process, the brain has devised shortcuts. Besides being entertaining, there is an explanation for what you see or don't see. For time's sake, I'll give you the short version of a complex process. It all has to do with how the lens of the eyeball focuses light back onto the retina. Information about the light entering the eye travels through the optic nerve, where it is ultimately interpreted by the brain. The brain uses our memory in order to make sense of the images that it sees. Now that requires too much brain power to process. So in order to simplify the process, the brain has devised shortcuts to understand what it is seeing. Our brain devises shortcuts. Let me say that again. Our brain devises shortcuts. So remember that. My favorite, the last slide. This is my favorite optical illusion because it really challenges one's perception. It's interesting, right? Kevin V. Neiman explains that being aware of the impact of our mental shortcuts, also known as cognitive biases, can lead to better decisions. For that to happen, we have to be willing to evaluate our thinking honestly and objectively, which requires discipline. I'd like to share a personal story with you. After graduating from college, I landed a great job working in a prestigious law firm in Philadelphia. After about two years, I decided it was time to move on to greater heights. So I pulled out my best suit, I polished up my resume, I conducted mock interviews, and I studied the company I was most interested in. This was my interviewing preparation ritual. My preparedness paid off because I nailed the lengthy phone interview and I was invited to a face-to-face -face interview with the manager. I remember thinking, if she liked me over the phone, I was going to really knock her socks off once we met. You see, I was young and confident, obviously, but I backed it up with professionalism, impeccable skills, and interviewing savvy. So, the day of the interview, I walked in the office building and the receptionist greeted me. She took my name and she asked me to be seated because the manager was running a little late. No problem. I was okay with that because it gave me time to ponder the answer to possible interview questions like, 
So, tell me about yourself. After about 15 minutes of waiting, another candidate approached the receptionist. She gave her name, and she was told the interviewing manager was running late also. She, too, asked, was asked to be seated. She sat on the opposite side of the room, and I looked over and I thought to myself, hmm, my competition. Well, may the best woman win. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's the wrong slide. More accurately, I was unbothered by the apparent competition because I knew if I put my best foot forward, if I made an earnest effort, all things being equal, I had at least a 50-50 chance of getting the job. I was confident that the most skilled and the best qualified candidate would get the job offer. I also hoped being scheduled first might give me the opportunity to make a first and lasting impression. So I got back to rehearsing in my mind the answers to, so what are your five-year goals and what are your greatest achievements? My thoughts were interrupted as the door to the manager's office opened. A peppy yet professional woman stepped out. Well, I was ready. With a smile on her face, she glanced my way. She walked with purpose and there was assertion in her eyes as she proceeded. In one full swoop, I gathered my briefcase and I moved toward the edge of my chair. She appeared a bit animated when she put forth her outstretched hand with assurance. Now with all the groundwork I had laid and all the rehearsing I had done up to this point, I was not prepared for what happened next. You see, the manager, with her purposeful walk, her outstretched hand, proceeded to walk right by me, directly toward the other candidate. And while enthusiastically shaking her hand, she incorrectly exclaimed, you must be Maureen. Wow, what just happened? Well, Harvard University professor and author of Blind Spot, Hidden Biases of Good People, Dr. Mahasrin Banaji states, we'd like to believe we are all open-minded, fair, and without bias. But research shows otherwise. This is an important, even if uncomfortable, realization for most of us. So what exactly is a bias? A bias is a strong preference for or against something for reasons that do not have a rational basis. Most assumptions are based on biases. In the year 2017, many corporations have earnestly committed to supporting diversity. So why are we still faced with issues of bias? Howard Ross, author of Everyday Bias, suggests that breakthroughs in the cognitive and neurosciences give some idea why our results seem inconsistent with our intentions. And David Cycleback, an author and art and artifact scholar, explains it this way. People's views of the world and even of facts are affected by biases. We all have a range of biases. We all have prejudice, meaning judging before all the facts are in, jumping to conclusions, and predepositions or strong likings to something based on tempor temperament or prior experience. The problem, he says, arise when biases prevent us from being able to make what should be or is represented as rational judgments. Many of our biases make us jump to false conclusions. Many of our biases cloud what should be clear vision. Many people confuse bias for fact or truth. The interviewing manager proved to be biased when she mistook the other candidate, who happened to be white, for me. Perhaps it was my name, Maureen Bradley. After all, both my first and last name are Irish derivatives. 
Perhaps. We had spoken at length on the phone. Perhaps it was my professional dialect. Or could it have been my degree, qualifications, and experience that led her to believe these attributes all belong to someone other than the young woman of color? Most will agree with Howard J. Ross that the word bias often has a derogatory connotation. But if you're human, you are biased and that most well-intentioned people don't see themselves as biased toward different races or different genders. But remember earlier I talked about our brain devising shortcuts when processing illusions? Like driving on autopilot, cognitive or subconscious bias are like mental shortcuts. Making day-to-day -day choices based on what is appealing or not appealing to us is how we operate as humans. Innocently, I may select the red car over the blue one or the polka dot dress over the striped, but the implicit or hidden biases triggers us to remember preferences for or against people, things, experiences at an unconscious level. Like driving on autopilot, Cognitive or subconscious bias are like mental shortcuts, but the implicit or hidden biases triggers us into remembering preferences for or against people, things, experiences at the unconscious level and without intent, but they interfere with good decision making and lead to biased outcomes. According to Roxbird and Hans, Understanding unconscious bias and its roles in recruitment and selection is essential for organizations looking to diversify their workforce. So what can we do? The first thing we need to do is identify unintentional biases. However, I agree with behavioral economists and professor at the Harvard Kennedy School, Iris, Bonet. It is exceedingly difficult to remove bias from an individual. It's possible to design organizations in ways that make it harder for biased minds to skew judgment. We should stop wasting resources trying to de-bias mindsets and instead start to de-bias hiring procedures. Work sample tests, structured interviews, and Comparative evaluation are the smart and right things to do, allowing us to hire the best talent instead of those who look the part. Smarter design of our hiring practices and procedures may not free our minds from, the sh from our shortcomings, but it can make our biases powerless, breaking the link between biased beliefs and discriminatory and often simply just stupid actions.